Good afternoon, good morning, good evening, depending on where you're uh, dialing from. My name is Junior Valerio. I'll be your host for this webinar. Uh, we're just going to give it a couple of more minutes. Uh, we wanted to be Swiss about the starting time, uh, but we're actually going to give it uh, a few moments just for a few more people to, to dial in and uh, uh, stay tuned. And uh, we'll be shortly back with the beginning of uh, the webinar. Thank you. Well, we've uh, just did the 101 attendees, so I thought this would be a good place to start as any. Um, if you're just connecting to us now, uh, again, welcome uh, to another Flyability webinar series. My name is uh, Junior Valerio, and I'll be the pleasure of being uh, the uh, moderator and one of the presenters uh, today. Uh, the titles of today's webinar, as you can see, is uh, Addressing uh, ATEX Issues and Equipment Inspections. Uh, I have the pleasure of introducing two very illustrious and prestigious um, speakers with me today. We have uh, Martin Stenkamp, uh, metallurgist, uh, DMSM product at Anglo American, and Simon Pollitt, which is the chief surveyor at ICL Bulby in uh, uh, in the UK. So. Um, a little bit of a uh, house rules and introductions for those of you who do not know or are not familiar with the um, uh, with GoToWebinar as a platform. Um, you have the opportunity to ask questions to the presenters using uh, the module on the right. Um, we'll try to go through as many questions as we can uh, during the end of the presentation and obviously feel free to uh, ask me directly or or any of the uh, of the two other panelists um, if, uh, your next question was whether there was going to be a recording available or not the answer is yes it will be distributed to you in the next couple of days uh, after the end of the webinar in terms of agenda for today we will cover a very short introduction on on flyability we'll keep that uh, to a minimum to give space to two very interesting topics for discussions. Uh, the first one we're going to focus on something a little bit unusual and uh, that is not normally covered when we talk about mining, which is equipment inspections. Uh, specifically, we're going to go down to South Africa uh, to Martin and have a look at how the Ilias 3 technology has benefited Anglo-American for uh, crusher inspections. Um, then we're going to uh, have a short discussion on some of the uh, benefits and uh, pros and cons of this technology. And then we're going to fly all the way over uh, to the UK and to speak with Simon uh, at ICL Bulby to uh, 
uh, to go into the details of actually how the LiDAR technology that is included in Ilios 3 um, has helped with the 3D scanning in, uh, in mining. We're then going to close up with the Q&A session, uh, both using some questions of my own and obviously uh, lots of the questions that are going to be coming from, uh, from the audience. Um, having said that, uh, let's, dive, let's dig right into the introduction of uh, uh, Flyability. For those of you who do not know Flyability uh, as a company, uh, Flyability is a scale-up uh, based in uh, Switzerland. Uh, Lausanne, from where I'm speaking to you today, uh, established in 2014. That is now at its third product iteration uh, called uh, Ilios. And the motto of the company since the very uh, establishment has, has been to uh, remove uh, humans from doing dangerous jobs. Uh, and in particular, we're focused on uh, one niche of the UAV technology aspect, which is confined spaces. And um, we've been quite successful in this endeavor by um, racking up together uh, approximately uh, more than 700 customers so far uh, that have uh, put together an impressive list of more than 100,000 flights performed today and uh, more than 1,500 uh, drones deployed to this day. And it's very important to, to remember that flyability as such is not an inspection company. We are an original equipment uh, manufacturer that focuses on the provision of hardware and software, as we will be able to see during the course of the webinar today. Uh, these are just some of the most relevant uh, customers for um, some of the uh, segments that we've, uh, that we've been able to, to cover. And obviously, it would be remiss of us not to mention also the amazing distribution network that we've been able to build over the course of the last nine years, uh, covering uh, pretty much every major uh, market from uh, Canada to Australia and from uh, Finland to South Africa. The, throughout the course of, of the last nine years and throughout the three different product iterations that we've had, the three core pillars of our value propositions have been built around uh, improving safety, reducing downtimes, downtimes and lowering costs. This is really sort of the trifecta of the value proposition of uh, um, UAVs in general when applied to inspections, but uh, even more so when we talk about inspections in confined spaces. And today you'll have the pleasure of and the possibility of hearing really from uh, on-field experts that will be able to, to testify uh, to those accounts and really look at the details of how uh, this technology has helped uh, the respective company to tick the boxes in terms of avoiding human entry in confined spacing, drastically reducing uh, the time necessary to perform uh, important, sometimes necessary inspections. Uh, all of this achieved at a significantly lower cost compared to traditional means of inspections. Uh, for those of you that are not familiar with the product, uh, this is the Helios 3. Um, a product that was launched very successfully uh, about a, a year ago and uh, that has become sort of the gold standard for uh, confined spaces inspections. Uh, one of the key benefits and one of the key features of the technology is the ability to integrate visual and digital data. Uh, the drone is uh, mounted with um, a LiDAR sensor that is able to capture in and re relay in real time information about the surroundings uh, and capture simultaneously uh, high resolution 4K images for uh, a side by side comparison between the asset in its entirety using the digital uh, information captured by the LiDAR and the optical information captured by the camera in 4K. Now, uh, without further ado, uh, I'd like to introduce Martin Stenkamp, a metallurgist and uh, DMS and product at Anglo America. Martin, first of all, welcome. Uh, thank you so much for, for being with us today. Uh, I'm very excited to have the opportunity to, uh, uh, to showcase uh, this particular inspection. Um, perhaps uh, considering that um, not everyone, I assume, on the, uh, among the attendees today has seen uh, the Helios 3 uh, in action, we thought it might actually be a good idea to start really uh, by showcasing the capabilities of uh, of the drone, because very often there is a, a huge element of mistrust regarding what we don't know, and, 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 and there's a natural element of, of mistrust also when it comes to, to innovation. 
Uh, sometimes we see some some very cool trailers online and we think that that's actually uh, the perfect solution to our problems then we try it in real life and it actually doesn't work but the flyability we really pride ourselves to be able to demonstrate uh, more and more often the real uh, value that these uh, that these drones deliver and the real applications in real life that our technology has so um, martin um, if uh, uh, if you wouldn't mind uh, I'm going to start by uh, presenting the, the video uh, of the crusher inspection, and it would be great to have um, your commentary on it. Thank you. So I've I'm muted. Hi, Martin. Yeah, we can hear you. Yeah. Right. Okay. So just a quick intro. We're entering the crusher here. This is the, I think it's like three floors down below ground level. That's the inspection hatch. It's the bottom of the primary crusher. Um, I think just some background. It's, it's, a, it's an iron ore mine. So that's actually a red dust. It's a very dusty environment. So we normally send people through that inspection hatch. Um, we need to, to inspect there so we've got the new issue with the crusher blocks and we thought it will be a good idea to, to use a drone for those inspections rather than have to use people um, so that's the bottom of the crusher that's where the ore will come out um, the, you see the dust going through that's the channel where you enter and then it's clear once in so looking up um, that's the discharge from the ore primary crusher is now above you um, yeah, so this is the whole, the whole cavity beneath the, 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 the primary crusher. So our challenge here was the, yeah, our challenge here was, was blockages on the, um, the crusher arms above you. So we, we basically need to see if there is a blockage. If there is a blockage, that, that um, rock that's stuck behind the liner. We actually didn't know it's, it's rocks getting stuck behind liners until we used the drone to, to, to properly see. Um, what it looks like up there. You'll see now where we go up. Um, just a point, so this is the, actually the dashboard of the drone. So you flying the drone will see this, this the camera view, plus on the right bottom, that's the LiDAR view. So, which is great, especially in this environment, because you can get lost in there flying the drone. So the LiDAR is great to, to also, not only for post-processing post for measurements and such, but also just to, to guide you how to get out of there. So. Up there, you see crusher arms. Um, these place here on the left, that's the, that's the liners. That's, it's these liners that we have the issue, the challenge that they're coming loose. We, uh, we need a long standing time to sort that out. I'll explain some more in the presentation, but uh, basically you get rocks getting stuck behind those liners. Those rocks um, will slightly impact the crusher and then as the crusher um, as, the, as you add the load or a, or a discharge on top, the, it will have the um, crusher trip on a load. And once tripped on a load, then it takes up to two days to clear the crusher. Um, that uh, no, uh, recording um, point of interest that we saw now, the, it's possible with the drone to, to take that recording. You'll see also there on the LiDAR view that it will reference that um, picture that you took. Up there, we just showed was the, the blockage. So at, with this inspection, this was a, um, a test run to, to, to see if the, the drone's option. The crusher was actually at this stage stuck under load. So in other words, there was a lot of ore on top of you at the moment. Um, and here we can see view. the 3D live, or live map that is being generated by the drone in uh, just under four minutes. And so uh, that's also, yeah, yeah, go ahead. <laughs> so just the last thing, so it is also nice here with this inspection with the crusher stuck on the load is you could see on which side of the crusher the blockage was. So it was, it was possible to, to focus your efforts on top of the crusher at that specific point to, to help you unblock the crusher quicker. Um, yeah. Well, thank you very much for for that, Martin. And uh, we uh, 
uh, we don't want to take sort of too much away from uh, from the presentation. That was, a, I think, the best possible introduction to the technology and to your topic of uh, uh, of the discussion. So uh, I'm just gonna uh, stop the video now and hand it over to you uh, for uh, for the presentation. Um, if uh, if you could also uh, turn on your camera, that would be fantastic. If we could see you as well. There you go. Perfect. Hi, Marty. How are you doing? Hello. Good in you. Um, Perfect. Okay. Uh, uh, take, uh, take it away. And uh, thanks a lot once again for, for doing this with us. Appreciate it. Okay. So I'm going to jump in to cluster inspection um, that we wanted to use it for. Uh, make sure I can see. I'm just looking into my own face here. Okay. My presentation. So the. The, um, there in the background, that's a picture from the of the block crusher on top. The, yeah, um, so basically, the, the what I explained now, the rocks get wedged. Those wedging causes the, the impairs the movement of a crusher, so it trips under load, and it can really take up to two days to to unblock a crusher. Um, so the, just to show the scale also of, of, of the crusher, it can take up to a one point. Bigger than a one meter rock there. You can you can literally throw a car in there. Um, so we don't tip uh, first onto a um, separate conveyor or anything like that. The big trucks, more than basically 300 tons per load, tips directly into the crusher. So there, that's the um, pile drive we use. So the people here on the left bottom of the slide, that's the man handling that pile drive. You need to you lift it off the crane, but then you need to connect the hydraulic pack and all of that. It's also, you need to, uh, working at heights, There's you need to secure the people not to fall into the crusher cavity. So there's lots of risks involved with, with unblocking the crusher and, and not only, not even thinking about all the production loss. So just to show the, the extent of our issue once the, the crusher blocks. Uh, go to the next slide, if I, there you go. So to do an inspection, um, to prevent that whole scenario of the, to looking for um, not to block the crusher, we started doing crusher inspections. We didn't have to use do this in the past, but uh, but now with the liners failing, um, we first did it twice per day, but now we're at once per day. Um, but that picture on the right hand, that's the crusher line uh, arms beneath the crusher cavity. So. You need to inspect those, but to do that inspection, you need to make the crusher safe first. So this ring, this is the same um, picture as the previous one with the blocked crusher. So this time we have a ring in place. So that ring is put there to prevent rocks from slipping in, um, rocks from falling in, to, uh, which won't be nice for the people building beneath um, doing the inspection. So you need to put that ring in. You also need to prevent trucks from tipping. So we don't just tell people not to tip. You also, uh, we put in um, hard barricade. We physically, it's not just a robot you turn red for to prevent the truck from tipping. You also need to physically stop them just to make sure it's really safe. Um, yeah, so all of that actions, all of that preventions, everything takes time and time is production. So then on top of that, before you're doing all of this, to get those people inside the cavity level, you saw the drone now um, on the video. So that cavity level, that will be too deep for a, for a, a, a operator. He won't, he won't reach up to the, the crusher arms. So you need to first tip in some ore um, without extracting, without the feeders running at the bottom of the uh, cavity level. So you, to give that um, operator doing the inspection a, a foot rest, a level to stand on. So that's also more, um, complexity added. So it's a bit of a high risk inspection, and this all will take now, late now that we were more uh, used to it or more um, familiar with the process, it takes about 45 minutes to do this inspection. But we do have frequent overruns where yeah, things go wrong or we wait for people and such. So the alternative was doing this with the, with the inspection with the drone. So Still do, we haven't started this, but we're about to. We um, still have to get permissions and such. So this test run um, proved it's possible. So the intention will be still be a daily inspection, but this time you'll only fit the ring. Um, 
not necessary to stop the, the put the physical barricade for the trucks in. So that will save some time. Um, the ring we basically use overhead crane just to put it in place. So that saves some time. Um, then you don't need that high and minimal cavity level. Um, so it's a much less risk inspection this time. So we estimate about a 50 minute inspection. So it's a saving half an hour a day. That's uh, about $2.6 million per month saving in production if we, if we use this. Um, so this drone will pay itself off quite quickly. Okay, but some of the challenges. So we, we, we do have a challenge that the, the mine is a no-fly zone airspace. Um, so we can only use the drone for indoors. We need special permission to fly outside or do other inspections. Then um, the dust, that's also a challenge we have. So you saw in the video that the dust, so you need to, you need to fly and, and, and get it over with. So you can't just hang around in the dust. So that's what, what happened in the video. You, you see this dust, so you, you flew in, um, it helps a bit. Uh, and then also the training of operators. Myself got trained on the, on the drone and it's, 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 it's easy now, but initially not so much. So um, it's actually a lot of fun, but uh, yeah, so we need to, to, to target the, the, um, the training as well. Advantages, quick inspections. Um, yeah, we're thinking of other 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 uses we can do um, use the drone for. It's, yeah, there's quite a few scenarios where it will be helpful. Um, save us a lot of time and, and such. So we have confined spaces. You don't want people with confined spaces. And then also the there's sometimes you need to do direct scaffolding, which can take hours um, just to see if what what what's the situation, whether a pipe, pipe is leaking or, or yeah, what's the condition of um sheeting or such so in this case you can you can start doing using the drone for that and then that multi-view function um so the the drone you use a, a tablet on, on the drone on the controller but that tablet with a view this this view you see here can also be linked to another tablet so you can have your manager your engineering manager or such looking on the other drone um, already seeing exactly what you're seeing flying the drone so we can also guide you to see what um, else you should look at or, or focus on or take a picture. So that will help a lot. And then also that clear and instant so that it's not an opinion anymore. So blockage, how bad is the situation really? All of that, it's, it, it's, you're not subject to, to a, an operator's opinion or someone's pessimistic or optimistic view. Um, yeah, that's my story. Thank you. And it's definitely a great one. Thank you for uh, uh, for sharing this with us, uh, Martin. Now um, I have written down some uh, some questions that uh, I'd definitely be keen to uh, uh, to ask you. I'm also uh, aware that we have um, Simon coming up, so uh, perhaps I'll just keep it to sort of two of the most. Um, uh, important one. So um, you, you've talked about, and we, we showcase, I think, in very de in, in, in detail, very much in detail, the um, the crusher inspections. Obviously, there is plenty of other uh, complicated, sophisticated, and dangerous equipment to be inspected on site. Have you already given some thought to some of the other uh, areas of application for for the drone in the mine in general, both? uh with regards to equipment or also uh with respect to the uh, to the mine itself yes so uh, there's a lot of um confined spaces that we use um you have to get people in there to check the condition we have we use a drum there's a drum beneficiation plant so there's uh, not a lot of space in there and you um, it's a confined there's no uh, fresh air in there so that's a high risk for us so we'd really like using the drone for that. Then we also have dewatering bunkers. So it's a very difficult, um, huge um, bins that, that dewater ore. So basically, uh, yeah, drying bunker. So, but to inspect those, you need a special car um, cart that was created on wheels that at the angle can go down there. But it's a um, yeah, very uncomfortable, very tedious, um, difficult process um, to, to inspect those and to send people in there. So with the drone, yeah, it will be quick and easy. Um, yeah, there's a lot of similar places. And then what I've mentioned also, the just a normal inspection where you use a, a scaffolding. You, you frequently have to, to erect scaffolding 
at difficult um, locations that we can now just quickly check with the drone. And um, we haven't put a lot of focus on the on the um, infrared as well. So we think that will also help to to see imminent failures on on, on um, bearings and rollers and such. So we can also use that that not infrared the thermal thermal camera. Yeah. So we also Which is part of the that. of the standard payload for both uh, for both Dalius two and Dalius three. Uh, Martin, last question from my side. I, I'm trying to imagine your first conversation with uh, the purchasing manager, the manager of the plan. Uh, did, how did you go about pitching this internally? And aside from the numbers that I think are pretty strong and they make a very definitive case for the use of the Helios compared to the traditional means of inspection, but how did you go about uh, selling this internally and what kind of objections or rejections did, did you have to face and how did you overcome those? It's actually not a good thing to ask that um, for me because I don't think we've told <laughs> you know the situation yet but uh, so with the castle was blocked when we wanted to test this drone so we took that inspection video to a plant manager and he didn't want the drone to leave site we wanted to buy it at that <laughs> at the same time actually so um, yeah, but we still had to get permissions and do, um, do the risk assessment. So we, we basically started from, yeah, as we did by treat all, all new equipment, it's a risk assessment. You see, and you make sure people are trained. Um, you, you, we, we enjoyed the training also by, by flyability. Um, yeah, so basically from the start, risk assessment training. And now at the moment, also where to place it. We don't want people stealing this or use it for, for, for fun break it, um, yeah, things like that. It's, but but on the production side, the savings, that it was a quick sell. Excellent. Well, Martin, thank you so much for, for that. I'm sure we're already starting to receive um, quite a few questions and I'm sure we'll have more topics for discussion at the end of the, uh, of the webinar. Uh, for uh, the time being, um, I'm gonna hand it over to uh, our other presenter, uh, Simon, and you know, in the words of uh, Jamiro Kwei, we're going uh, uh, deeper underground in the sense that we're going to go into the depth of the ICL Bulby mine, uh, which, if I'm not mistaken, is one of, if not the um, l uh, deepest point in the whole of the United Kingdom. Um, Simon, thank you for joining us. Thank you for being us today, with us today. Uh, really looking forward to, uh, to your presentation. And uh, perhaps you can tell us a little bit more about uh, what you do in your in your daily life when you're not uh, a guest on uh, on our webinar. Hello, good afternoon, everyone. Am I missing the button for share my screen, Julio? Uh, coming right up. No problem. One second, everybody. Should be right with you. There we go. There we go. Hi, so I'm Simon Pollitt. I'm the Chief Surveyor at ICL Bowlby. Um, I need to give you a little bit of history about our mine first before I crack into the presentation. Um, we were a mine the shaft started sinking in 1963. Um, we began extracting potash mineral in the early 1970s, and we continued doing that until 2018. At that point, we were more or less exhausted the potash resource, and we needed to move over to something called polyhalite. We are the first mine in the world to be mining polyhalite, and we are currently at mining it at a rate of 1 million tonnes per annum. Potash and polyhalide, from their structural perspectives, are very different. Um, potash is quite an elastic material, whereas polyhalide has a significantly higher compressive strength, but lacks the strength under tension that um, potash had. At that point, we needed to review design in order to best utilise the underground mineral resource. In order to do that, we went through over the past 10 years different designs and it quickly became evident that we could maximize profitability by moving towards a herringbone retreat system. Now, uh, legally, Martin, 
I am very sorry to interrupt you. However, we're seeing simultaneously both your current slide and your next slide. So you might want to try and switch to uh, presenter mode. I'm very sorry to do this to you. No problem. You probably need to give me a bit more direction, um, Julia. What do you need me to? Um, is that, there is that you better? go. Perfect. That's it. You nailed it. Thank you very much. Everything's working yes. now. No worries. Um, right. So where was I? Um, we were working through different mine designs, and we eventually arrived at wanting to do a herringbone retreat because it added benefit with reduction in support costs. And it would allow us to extract more mineral at a lower cost. However, by doing that, in the UK, we are required by law to accurately represent the underground workings. And with a herringbone retreat system, it meant that we wouldn't be able to access the workings to measure them because the as you retreat backwards, you can't, people can't go past it and they go into unsupported areas. Just a quick overview here on this slide of the current and previous measuring process. Measurements are taken once a month. Um, prior to measurement, we assess what needs to be measured through that month, through the month with the production department. We then go through measure and what has been extracted that month and then reconcile what's been done so we can present the tonnage output for each month. Um, I will now show you through what um, herringbone layout looks like. So this is a standard layout. Um, tunnels are put out with interconnecting crosscuts, linking together for ventilation. Once the roadway has been established to full distance, we can then move back and begin a retreat, taking wedges off the left and right sides intermittently. And as we come back, those areas are then left. No one can go into that area for measurement purposes or to check anything. It's not safe to do so. Um, it's at this point we want to look to measure. And as we were um, learning this design, we did not know how we were going to measure this because traditional scanning systems would miss the corners and we wouldn't be able to fully reconcile what's been taken. So we needed to work out how we were going to measure it. As you can see, once the district comes back, we're fully exhausted. We can then start the mining layout in a second pattern southwards of what I'm showing on screen. So how did we measure the inaccessible? We became aware of the alias three about two years ago when it was first in its testing phases through a company that we use work with quite closely called Geoslam, who produce LiDAR hand scanners. Um, Geoslam and flyability have worked closely together in producing this, this drone and the post-processing software that it goes with. Um, we looked into different methods of how we could measure the area. First of all was the cheap and cheerful system where we could just have a cable tied from the face all the way back to the start of the district and we could um, essentially rig the drone and wheel it into the workings with a scanner hung on it and then pull it back out. However, when we calculated what load would be on the center of that wire halfway down the district, that would mean it would need to be pulled to attention four or five tons, which if they clipped it with a mining machine would quite easily kill someone. So that option was very quickly written off. We then looked at, which I'm sure all of you have probably come across, is the Boston Dynamic Spot, um, which we were hoping we could mount a LiDAR scanner to and then let it potter off into a district and complete the scan and come back out. However, this posed one major problem, or two really, where the first one being it is astronomically expensive at £100,000, plus the price of the scanner on top of that. It is also unable to climb a step higher than 300 millimetres, which for us was a, a non-starter. We then were more or less set on the LES3 and thought, yep, yeah, we've got our, we've got a mine design, we've got a way of measuring it, we're legally compliant, we can go forward from here and we're, we're happy. However, on our first on our first retreat district, we had quite a large um, inflow of methane, normal than we would larger than what we would normally expect. It was within the mining cut, the production had to stop and a disease assessment had to be carried out, which essentially meant, yes, we can mine it, 
we can we can handle this amount of um, methane within the current ventilation setup. But with any methane in a heading that we can't access to measure what's in there, we can't put an electric piece of equipment in and the, into the area without knowing what the gas levels are. So we had to rethink how we were going to implement the LEOS and what we were going to do with that. Eventually, we came up with the solution of what was, I think, first implemented in UK coal in the 1960s was a tube bundle monitoring system. Now, methane is lighter than air, so we'll always float to the top of the district. And what we have is a series of tubes running from the start of the district all the way to the end of each of the headings. We can attach pumps to those, pump out the methane, attach a gas detector to one end. And then before we fly, we can assess whether it's clean, whether it's clean air or whether there's any methane in the heading. Provided that there's no methane present, we can complete the flight. And this is the example of the pump that's used, and you can see pictures from underground where we have draw points clearly labelled with what cross cut numbers they are and how we go forward from there. Um, once that's complete, we can take a flight and then we can start to precisely update the mine plans and reconcile what's been mined on a month to month basis, updating the mine plans. And what this also has done is it's allowed us to accurately depict what is on the extremities of both sides of a panel, meaning that when we put another panel adjacent to it, we can drop that pin, um, pillar down between the two panels to exactly the design criteria, meaning we can utilize our mineral resource much better than we ever could have done without this piece of equipment. Um, moving on to the scan data, the data that comes back needs a little bit more work than traditional LIDAR data because it's drone based, but it is still the only only solution to a problem. What you can see in blue is the data straight off the LEOS. Um, the red is a control data from a scanner that's calibrated. And then green is the LEOS data that's been post-processed through the GSLAM software. So what you can see there is your Z value has actually been pulled back to, to correct as that red line is more or less parallel to the green line. Um, that is the end of my presentation. Please feel free to ask any questions should you should you want to. Well, uh, I certainly want to, Simon. First of all, I want to thank you again for this uh, very very uh, in depth analysis of uh, uh, how you've come to adopt uh, quite brilliantly, I would say, the Elias drone technology in um, in less than a year now. Uh, Martin has already touched upon it, but I wanted to, to come back on the importance of uh, uh, of training. Uh, if I'm not mistaken, you now have a team of three people that have been trained, including yourself, by by flyability. Um, how did you go about setting up this process? Do you think it was more difficult or easier than you thought it would be to uh, to use the the technology? And perhaps you can speak really on the um, on the on the ease of use and the ease of deploy, deployment for for this drone technology. So yes, it's a very simple piece of equipment to use. Um, particularly, my two team members picked it up incredibly quickly. Um, they're both young. I used to computer games, and you give them a handset with a couple of joysticks on it, they were off off like a rocket ship. Um, I was a little bit slower on the uptake, but yeah, I still thought it was a fairly straightforward process in order to to use the drone and utilize it. Thank you for that. And you obviously, uh, you obviously seen really the, the progress of of the platform for from its early days when it was still a a prototype to now where it's still a, a product for which we are constantly releasing uh, software updates. What was for you sort of the the moment in which you said, okay, this is it. This is actually uh, the solution that we need uh, at ICL would be right now. Uh, and sort of what managed to to convince you from skeptical to actually a, an evangelist, we could say almost a, a product champion of, of this solution. So there's a gentleman that works at GSLAM that we've always worked quite closely with called Owen Howells, who spoke of this wondrous piece of equipment that was an airborne drone that was fully armored that we could send into dangerous areas and bump off, bump off the walls and it would come back and provide us with a laser scan that we could utilize for reconciliation purposes. And when we heard that, it was like, where can we buy it? This is this is incredible technology. And um, in, internally, again, uh, similar question to, to to Martin. 
what kind of um, scrutiny, if any, uh, did you have to uh, uh, to undergo in order to uh, to approve the acquisition of uh, of this uh, piece of equipment? So we had to go to um, we went through an innovation funding and it went it went through there. It was assessed by our innovation team um, in Amsterdam. And it came back as, yeah, this is a great project. It should save us money on mineral resource by able to utilize the polyhalite deposit more than we currently are doing. Um, yes, we'll we'll go ahead with that. It took it took several months for the procedure to go through as it as it tends to with your with your larger mining companies. But once it was once it was through, we could purchase quickly and you guys delivered the training super fast after delivery. And yeah, it was then implemented and here we are three months into taking into the measurement process and it's it's had a few teething problems but it's done incredibly well and we wouldn't be without it well i i certainly i certainly do appreciate that martin and um, perhaps sort of last last question from my side in terms of uh, you know the three pillars that that, that we talked about uh, before you know uh, time cost and and safety uh, would you rate one on top of the other as far as your decision to acquire the technology goes or would you say that they're pretty much sort of uh, on a level playing field uh, when it comes um, the decision to to acquire this and use this technology? For us, it was mainly cost and safety. Okay, perfect. That's uh, uh, that's uh, short and sweet. Um, we'll now um, open it up to uh, to the audience in the sense that um, you've heard from from us and from uh, uh, our. Uh, panelists, um, we will now sort of, uh, we will like now uh, give the opportunity to, to hear from you. And we have presented two very short uh, poll questions uh, that will give us some uh, tips, suggestions to, to move forward uh, onto the, the discussion portion uh, of the meeting. So uh, the first one is actually um, uh, coming right up. And uh, it's about um, the uh, the applications. So, um, which uh, applications? Which of the following applications uh, do you find more relevant to to your organization? And we sort of provided uh, four options that we think could uh, give a pretty good um, overview of uh, um, uh, of, of the ensemble. And we're looking at visual equipment inspections, underground surveying, stockpile measurements, which is another big, big, big uh, added value of uh, uh, the Ilios drone and uh, um, uh, and sort of all uh, all other uh, applications. Um, we're still sort of coming in with some uh, with some answers. Uh, Simon, perhaps uh, this is a, a good opportunity to ask if you have identified. Uh, other potential areas of, of use for the uh, for the technology aside from uh, from what you just described. Do you yes. have any visual equipment inspections requirements, for instance? Yeah. So what we've we've noticed is we can actually use the drone, which is not what it was originally purchased for. But once the GOF has been taken back, the rock engineers were very keen to say, "Are you able to go in with the high definition camera on the drone and inspect the roof to see whether we've had any areas that have, have are about to fail and whether we can improve our design in order to better utilize better utilize the ore body and um, further to that the drone is also used weekly in stockpile measurements and post-processed and used to calculate um, about 15 different piles of muck a week to keep our books in order and in check well the, thank you very much for uh, for this additional piece of of information, and uh, I think I'm going to sort of close it up now. We have about uh, we have a quorum. We have 40, 52 uh, percent of uh, of the votes uh, in, and uh, we are basically looking at uh, 72 percent visual equipment inspections, 45 percent underground surveying, uh, 29 percent stockpile measurements, and 36 percent uh, other applications. Obviously, it's uh, um it's uh, it's more than 100 percent because we wanted to give uh the opportunity to people to uh vote for uh for more than than one options um it certainly looks like um uh, the the video that, that was presented by by martin um has really uh, hit it on the head in the sense that 
uh, we're happy to see that we, we selected the right material, the right speaker, and uh, the right audience for, for this particular uh, presentation. Um, now uh, going to move uh, forward to the uh, to the second poll, um, which is uh, what do you consider to be uh, the biggest obstacle to the implementation of um, a drone program inside your organization? And I think here we go back to to some of the uh, what one of the core issues that we've discussed with both uh, Martin and Simon, which is change management. Sort of how uh, do you adapt uh, uh, your 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 policies, your procedures, your your way uh, to to perform routine inspections and and really um, try to innovate, uh, changing the way that sort of things have been done for um, for quite a long time. Um, at this point, I think it would be interesting, Martin and Simon, to to hear from you to sort of from 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 your own personal perspective of. Of product champions and, and, and innovators, sort of, if if you um, if you felt that uh, the technology was mature enough, sort of, to to stake your reputation on it, or if there was sort of a, a moment or a situation where perhaps you felt, okay, I'm not sure actually that this is the the right direction to go. You're obviously here. You're obviously talking about the product, so uh, in the end, it was it was a happy ending. But I'm really keen to hear from you uh, from your own personal and professional experiences of how did you push this through the organization and what kind of approvals did you have to to seek for it in the uh, meantime, with those, yeah um, sorry um the, with those the, the i think there's quite a bit of a stigma attached with drones um unfortunately that they're often viewed by senior senior members particularly older members of the team that they can be a bit like toys but when you've got a drone that has a high definition camera and um, um, a LiDAR scanner and a heat sensor on it, it, it really does, it answers its own questions. Um, it massively changes the way we work and yes, it's an expensive piece of kit, but it has by far paid for itself over and over again. Which uh, which I guess it's a, it's a great uh, segue into the uh, the poll results because it actually looks like the, the the biggest concern on people's mind is really sort of the cost associated with acquiring the the drones and again uh, we uh, we come back to, to the issues of changing changing pro procedures and uh, and the way that uh, they were used to um to be uh, to be working uh, now i think the 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 the, the capex or opex depending on on the way that the, the the, the Ilios is acquired, it's always an interesting element of, of discussion, but I think that the both speakers, uh, both uh, you, Martin, uh, and, and you, Simon, have really pointed out that the, the, the ROI, it's really, uh, it's really been uh, almost uh, immediate. I mean, a matter of really of a few inspections, you have been able to recover the sum spent on the drone and, and then some. Um, speaking of which, Simon, have you actually perform any sort of detailed um, analysis or, or calculation uh, that you can uh, that you can share on the um, on the uh, on the ROI for for the drone so I, I briefly touched on this um, during the presentation and it's essentially when we have a long a long series of panels stacked up against one another what we can do is in, um, ensure that the panel width now is as low as design can expect in order to utilize a, a large a large ore body possible. So when we've got a series of 10 districts together, we can perhaps fit in an 11th due to knowing precisely where the where, that, where the previous district finished and the new one will start. Excellent. And uh, uh, Martin, from from I think one of one of the topics that I wanted to to cover from with you is actually also the importance of the of the local support because obviously it, it goes without saying that having uh, a distributor so close to you uh, in an area that, let's face it, is not the easiest to, to reach, um, certainly does provide an additional element of, of peace of mind for uh, whatever kind of, of support or additional uh, additional training is needed. Yeah, no, it's really out a lot. Um, it's, it's always great to have someone on, on, on quick dial to assist. And you also also the um, 
just the parts explaining how everything sits together and if something goes wrong yeah it's a quick fix uh, fantastic. So uh, let's. We still have about uh, five, six minutes left. So I'm going to take uh, some of the questions that that have come through in the in the meantime. Um, to everyone that has sent a written question, uh, we will reply um, either today in writing or tomorrow, or we'll try to take the opportunity um, on um, during the the webinar um, and. Uh, Perhaps, uh, oh yes, that's that's a great one from uh, Jen Chua Shi. It, it's asking, uh, could you talk a little bit more about signal loss issues? Uh, should the remote controller always be inside with the drone? Uh, great question for both of you, considering the, the complexities of, of the environment and perhaps a great opportunity also to talk about the, the range extender. I think you are on uh, mute. Uh, Simon? Hi, um, yeah, so we had an abandoned area that we needed to do an assessment of, oh, about two months ago, and we sent the drone in, and I was I was a little bit nervous doing this, up to about 250 metres away, down a 8 by 4 metre tunnel, and I was amazed to see that it was still in full communications at the other end, and we were, we got to the point where we were pushing it for battery life, and I to hoof it back as quick as as quick as I could, but um, yeah, it, it was very good in a straight line down a straight tunnel at, re, at responding. When we have to go through interconnecting crosscuts, we have to walk from one road to the other following the drone um, with it in order to keep the radio signal. We find once it's gone into a, a 90 degree crosscut, it will go about 10 meters in and then it will flag up um, weak signal, please come back to previous spot. and we do. You obviously, you don't want to risk it when you could potentially lose it. Um, Martin, obviously, uh, inspection uh, equipment it's a uh, it's a little bit different. But what what was your experience so far uh, with the with the s signal strength of of the drone? So so in our scenario is not as as tricky. Um, the the metal um, actually bounces the signal. It, it, that also acts as a as an extender, so we haven't really had signal issues at all. And I'd also like to add, so we had another um, question on the safety. So what uh, what will happen if, if it goes out of signal and such? So we we one of the things on the to 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 convince people how safe this is and and not the risk to, of flying away or going where it shouldn't is is we we had to test a few times. We actually put off the remote to see what a drone does and it. it responded quite nicely to just stop, sit down and shut off. So for us, that was a, a big bonus, what it actually does when the signal is lost. Yeah, and thank you so much for covering that because it's actually one of the uh, questions that had been asked uh, at the very beginning, sort of uh, uh, what happens sort of in case that there is a, uh, there is a loss of, of signal. Um, I want to take the opportunity, considering that it's one of the topics of, of today's uh, webinar really to to address this uh, in a way once and for all um, there's a lot of people sort of asking whether the drone is is x-rated um, the answer is no uh, as of today the, there is no uh, drone equipment that has that has achieved this level of uh, um, of uh, a certification um, number one because whenever uh, there's any sort of lithium battery that you use that becomes really really difficult uh, and obviously sort of the propellers do not help uh, what we cover today, what we try to cover today, what I think Simon covered incredibly well today, is the mitigation measures that can be put in place in order to uh, overcome this uh, this obstacle while we wait for uh, the technology uh, to catch up. Um, let me see if we... Uh, ah, yes, there's uh, an interesting question uh, from uh, Stephen Taylor. What type of flight paths are used to capture this data? We understand that having more overlapping path procedures uh, in path produce a better result. Are you using straight paths, zigzag, figure eights, etc.? cetera? Um, great question for, for the both of you. Perhaps I'll give the uh, the priority on this one to, to Simon as a, as a veteran of, of GeoSlam and, and, and all things LiDAR related. So with the flight paths, obviously the same as the handheld scanners, you want your flight to be as smooth as possible. 
Um, we have some headings that are up to 30 metres wide, so we tend to do a pass in and then a pass back and then a fourth pass, um, kind of in two two U shapes like this, um, to cover to cover the ground well. That is my my um, and um, my graduate surveyors' um, favoured method of picking up our workings. Um, excellent. I don't think we have uh, much more time. Uh, left, I just wanted to uh, let you know that there is the possibility of downloading uh, the uh, the brochure uh, with the technic and the technical specifications uh, from the panel uh, on the right. Uh, our staff is uh, uh, uploading it just now for for you to download, and it will also be made available, obviously, uh, after the the webinar, and you can obviously find it uh, online. And I think uh, we are going to uh, wrap it up here. Uh, once again, um, Simon, Martin, thank you so much for being with us today. I think this was incredibly uh, useful and uh, informative. Uh, stay tuned for uh, more uh, FlyABT events. And once again, uh, thank you very much for your time. Thank you. Yeah. Thank you, Simon. And a big thank you to uh, my colleagues, Paula, and Inga that have been working tirelessly behind the scenes to uh, to make this uh, this possible. I don't see the handouts uh, out yet, but we'll make sure to include them in the in the follow up email. Once again, thank you so much for your attention, and have a, a wonderful day ahead. Thank you.